topic. Uh, specifically, I was going to address some brush and weed control, which is kind of my key area. Talk a little bit about fertilization and grazing management, and hopefully be able to answer any of your questions uh, as, as we go along or, or at the end, whichever you prefer. Um, so, you know, talk about brush, and well, that's just woody vegetation that's usually considered undesirable for your planned use of an area. And here's a list of some species uh, that we often deal with. The ones on the left, are, are I'd categorize those as the shrubs, you know, lower growing plants, and, and then the ones on the right are some of the, the trees that, that we deal with. Um, and we'll be talking about some of those as, as we go along. And then the weeds are, are usually the herbaceous plants, and we can categorize those. Some of those are annuals, as you see there, you know, common broomweed, uh, lance leaf ragweed, I know is, is a common weed in, in southeastern part of the state. Uh, and then I get questions sometimes about uh, daisy fleabane and, and foxtails, and in particular on in, after brome harvest or something like that. Uh, the annuals tend to be what I call more ephemeral. They're opportunistic in terms of uh, when they come in, primarily based probably on uh, precipitation patterns, but they also could be a symptom of, of maybe some mismanagement. Uh, some plants like musk thistle and common mullein or biennials, you know, they take a couple years usually to complete their life cycle. And then we have the perennials, which typically are, are a little more difficult uh, to deal with. Uh, you know, ironweed, goldenrod, and so forth. Got to put hemp dog bait on that list because that's another one that I get questions about uh, fairly frequently. Uh, Johnson grass, of course, we deal with. And then old world blue stem and then Cerecia lespediza, which of course is one of our statewide noxious weeds. Now, brush is, a, is indeed a, a problem in, in eastern Kansas, you know, where we get you know, 30 to 40 inches of rain generally uh, without fire in particular in about 35 to 40 years, we can go from a grassland to a forest. So that can happen fairly, fairly quickly. You know, Eastern red cedar is one of those that comes in first, uh, but then we see others. This particular hill is outside of Manhattan and it's now dominated by oak trees. Uh, so in addition to the reduction of fire, you know, just climatic fluctuations have, uh, are involved with, with why these plants may come in. You know, both oh, drought cycles as well as wet years will have an impact. You know, the seed can get transported around different ways. Uh, over, overgrazing by domestic livestock could be a problem. And then as we get in our tame pastures, uh, like smooth brome and tall fescue, you know, decreased fertility uh, may be an issue. That, that's related to this brush and weed invasion. But I need to, you need to remember that some of these plants indeed have some value to them. Uh, we'll talk a little bit more about that as we go along here, but they can add production and quality to the animal's diet. Uh, some of the woody plants uh, are indeed eaten by animals. We know that uh, goats are more apt to browse, but cattle will eat certain woody plants. And then you see some other benefits listed there, including you know, maybe nitrogen fixation by legumes. And, uh, you know, trees can provide shade and winter protection as well. So here are four uh, species I wanted to let you know. These are from based on studies done here, diet studies done in, in the Flint Hills, but uh, these, these plants grow pretty, pretty widely in the state. Uh, but ones that we've found that indeed cows are eating. Uh, so you see the liatra species, the dotted gay feather, Heath aster that's blooming probably still yet the other day I saw some. Lead plants, a, a shrub, a leguminous shrub, and then purple prairie clover, another legume. But uh, these four species can make up a fairly significant portion of the diet during the course of the year. So as we think about various control and management options uh, for brush and weed control, here's kind of the list we can, can talk about. You gotta remember I'm a range guy, so so I've got grazing management there at the top, and, and I'll come back to that later in, in the presentation tonight, but uh, we'll talk about these other methods, mechanical prescribed burning, biological control, and, and then the use of herbicides or chemical control. So mechanical control, you know, they go from just little hand loppers that, that one can use and 
going out and checking your pasture, you know, even small cedars, uh, if you, you can go out and clip those off and that can be an effective approach. Um, I know the eastern part of the state and then our neighbors to the east in Missouri, they seem to like, they seem to like the mowing machine uh, for weed control. And then I have a couple pictures here of, of various, uh, two different kinds of tree cutters. Um, the one that kind of the rotary bladed there on the top and then the, the clipper on the bottom. And then in you know, extreme cases, sometimes bulldozers have been used to go in and shear trees off. Of course, as you go down that list, you know, that gets more and more expensive uh, to do those operations. Prescribed burning uh, is used quite a bit here in, in eastern Kansas and it's, and it's spreading elsewhere. Um, you know, it's primarily been used to enhance livestock gains with stalkers. You know, that's, we get about a, well, nearly a quarter pound average daily gain, additional, you know, additional gain when we burn that late springtime, you know, compared to unburning. So that's why you'll see that done quite frequently. We can also improve grazing distribution. And then of course, it does play a role for us in terms of brush and weed control. Uh, for instance, Eastern red cedars, uh, they're a non-sprouting species. And you can see some of these were, are pretty good size. And if you have enough fuel, you can burn down uh, reasonably uh, large trees. Uh, typically though, if we have, you know, if we leave maybe six to eight inches of, of grass out there on average, you know, that's, that's gonna amount to maybe 1,000 to 1,500 pounds the acre. We can burn three to four foot cedars under the right conditions. And again, since you, know, you, you don't even need to completely desiccate the tree, but if you desiccate, excuse me, the majority of it, uh, those trees typically will go ahead and, and die. Uh, biological control, here's the musk thistle head weevil, Rhinocillus conicus. Uh, it's pretty widely distributed in, in the state. I rarely go into a stand, at least in the, you know, eastern Kansas and north central Kansas where I can't find some of these uh, beetles, uh, we, yeah, the beetles during the course of the summer, let's say in June, July, is those heads right before they, they uh, well, the adults came out, you know, come out a little later there. One of the things that's happened with this method, though, is, is the regulations have changed and we're no longer, it's no longer legal to transport uh, the weevil across uh, uh, state lines. But they're out there in, in helping reduce seed production on, on musk thistle forests. I don't always know where to put goats in. Uh, you, that's a, you know, another type of grazing animal, but it could be categorized, I guess, as, as a biological control as well. And here's some goats uh, working on this. is actually salt cedar in southwestern Kansas, but we know that goats are, are, are browsers and, and uh, there are people that are, are using them for, for woody plant uh, control as well as uh, Cerecia lespedeza. So the chemical methods then that we have available to us, different ways of applying these, you know, from broadcast treatments when you have maybe severe cases, whether that's ground applied or by air, we can do individual plant treatments with say a high volume, you know, sprayer. Uh, you work high volume, I'm talking maybe 50 to 100 gallons per acre. Sometimes you're, you're uh, soaking the, the tree down quite a bit. Uh, there are single, you know, non-foliar methods, you know, individual plant methods as well, which are pretty commonly used. Particularly as we get into this time of year, we can do basal treatment and, and cut stump applications yet. There are a couple, there's some soil applied materials and I'll show you a picture of, of one of those. And of course the spot treatment, you know, is kind of in contrast, you know, to a broadcast treatment. Maybe we're just treating uh, individual spots or, or plants in, in a pasture. So here's a, a table I, I've used with a number of different woody plants and uh, some of the herbicides. And uh, so as you look at those, and the, this, this is based primarily on, on whether or not the, the species is listed on these labels. So that's, that's how this is put together. Uh, there, if the species doesn't happen to be on, the, on a label, it doesn't necessarily mean that it won't work just mean they may not have the information uh, at this point in time or, or whatever. But you know, there's products like, you know, Remedy Ultra and Pasture Guard are, are two of our common ones that are used for foliar treatment on, on woody plants. 
So you can, so, so you can see that uh, two and, and four there listed on a number of species, including, you know, honey, honey locusts, you know, cottonwood, Osage orange or, or hedge, uh, persimmon is, is a species you have in the eastern part of the state and, and so forth. But even some of our herbicides like 2,4-D, you know, can be effective on, on buckbrush and smooth shumac. Does somebody have a question or something? Okay, um, so I'll move on. Here's, here's a stand of, of honey locusts. And you know, I, I get lots of emails and phone calls about various species and, and honey locusts is in, my, in the top three that I get questions about. Uh, the other two are probably Cerecia lespedes and Old World Blue Stem at this point in time. But honey locust, you know, it's the one that's got the thorns on it, a tremendous re-sprouter. And here's some work done a number of years ago, and this is foliar applications. You know, products that contain picloram like the Grazon and surmount products are, are usually fairly effective on a legume like, like honey locust. A couple of different years here, 2011 and 12, if you remember those years, there was some dryness and particularly 2012 and at this location where I treated was the drier year. And so you, you compare those two years and you see uh, some of the herbicides were not as effective during that dry, drier year in 2012. But then there's some like surmount, you know, over 90% control both times. Uh, the milestone, uh, which is very effective on, on honey locusts, was also very effective uh, both, both years. So those are foliar treatments. Buckbrush, you know, one of our common shrubs, and, and uh, it, it occurs throughout and can get to be a problem in, in fairly large colonies or clumps in a pasture. Uh, don't have any, don't believe I've got any data to share with you, but necessarily on buckbrush, but it's a, it's a place, species that is usually leafed out, you know, in, in the latter part of April when we might still be able to burn. And uh, if we can burn, you know, it maybe takes two or three years in a row in that late springtime when buck brush is leafed out, we can usually set it back a considerable amount. Uh, repeated mowing in, in early to mid-May uh, can also reduce buck brush stands. And the reason that's uh, successful is because that timing is, is when uh, the, we're kind of at a low point in the carbohydrate cycle of that plant. And so we're kind of starving it to death over time. Chemicals like say 2,4-D will do a good job on buck brush, probably the a low volatile ester would probably be more effective than an amine, uh, as long as you get it in that, that window uh, by mid-May. Uh, Grazon works. Chaparral has given us the ability to maybe extend the spray season a little bit, maybe uh, into early June, uh, but I've still seen it uh, at three ounce rate to be a little more successful if I spike it with a little bit of 2,4-D uh, on buck brush. Well, here's some blackberry data. This, this is data I collected this down in, in uh, Woodson County. Uh, you know, the MAT-28 is, is an experimental compound. Uh, it's not yet labeled on range and pasture. There's some rates there. When, well, particularly when I combine, well, the three ounce rate and when I combine it with escort were effective, but two that, that are readily available and are quite effective on, on blackberries are escort XP. Uh, these, were, these were fully applied with, actually with a boom sprayer. So I was putting out 20 gallons per acre, but one ounce, which is a pretty good dose, was effective as well as the, the four pints of pasture guard. And so those were effective on, on blackberries. Uh, some of the older research I did years ago too, uh, uh, Remedy can, can have, have an effect, although I found that actually it worked better if I would burn off the blackberries in the late spring and wait about four weeks, you know, and they regrow and then spray them with the remedy out. That was a pretty effective treatment. Most time these are these treatments are, are done uh, you know, June or July around bloom to berry production. Uh, but I think you also could treat, particularly with the escort product uh, in the late summer, as long as the leaves are still still green. So cut stump applications, I put this in, this is a small stump, but just to point out that, you know, usually the, the we want to, you know, once the trees get to be maybe oh four, five, six inches in diameter, then we're probably uh, we're going to use less herbicide if we treat this, cut it off, and treat the stump. 
rather than doing a basal treatment, you know, that goes 12 to 15 inches all the way up from the ground level up, up the trunk. But when you do that, it's, it's the important thing to treat then is that cambium or the living tissue. That's the, you know, the white looking sap material that you see off toward the outside. The, the heartwood is, is uh, you know, that transports the water, but that's a non-living tissue and you don't really need to, to treat that. Now in this particular example, you see there's a little bit of trunk left there. And I, of course, if I cut them off, I, I prefer to do it right to ground level. But uh, if you have a little bit of trunk there, you wanna spray that as, that as well as the, the, the cut uh, surface. So here's a, again, another table for cut stump treatments. Uh, again, in, you know, crossbow and remedy, or you'll find one, one or the other or both on all those species that are listed there. Um, Pathfinder 2 is very effective as well. Uh, Pat, I don't know if you're familiar with that product. It it's contains triclopyr, which is the same active ingredient that we have in Remedy, but it's a, a uh, ready to use product. You don't have to mix it with anything, so that can be sometimes an advantage. Um, again, Milestone is listed there. It's very effective on, on honey locusts as a cut stump treatment. In fact, it's probably among the best treatments that we have on that uh, species as a cut stump. Some of our more products like, like the Dicamba products, Bangle Clarity, uh, Roundup type products, I put Glystar Original here. One of the things I'll, I'll remind you is that you really need to look at the Roundup labels. Uh, some of them are labeled for use on range and pasture, and frankly, some of them are not. And uh, Glystar Original, it says it's labeled for, for non-cropland, but then you go on the label and you look and it lists range and pasture under the non-cropland description. So it would be legal to use. Uh, it's a three pound per gallon uh, no, acid equivalent product. Others, uh, another one that would be labeled that I, that I use is, is uh, Roundup Power Max. And it's a little higher concentration. It's got four and a half pounds acid equivalent in it. But it's labeled on any terrestrial site, which obviously covers range and pasture. Uh, so here is a little data again, basal, basal bark cut stump treatments I did on, on honey locusts. Um, again, so that, you know, they, they were treated in yeah, November of that particular year, rated the next uh, 10 months after application. And, you know, they don't have them all both treatments, you know, but the, look at the remedy ulcer, the 25%, and that's, that's kind of the labeled rate where it talks about maybe at least typically we'll use one, one part chemical to three parts diesel. Uh, so that's what that would be, was more effective as a basal treatment than it was on cut stump that particular year, um, as was the was pasture guard. Uh, and that can be the case with some of these products. Uh, the next year though, now this is just cut stump and those treatments that I used, including the remedy and pasture guard, um, which are or mixtures in diesel, the arsenal is 10% in water. There's the Pathfinder too, again, a ready to use product and milestone 10% in water, and those were quite effective that particular year. So like I say, cut stump and these basal treatments indeed can be this done this time of the year and be very effective. Here's a picture then of, of the pronome power pellets, one of our soil applied materials. Kind of reminds me of a, of a Alka-Seltzer tablet. You know, it's the active ingredient in that is hexazinone, which is, a, if you're familiar with Velpar Al, uh, that's that's uh, the same chemical. Uh, so here's the other dry product that can be soil applied that's been around quite a while is Spike 20P. Uh, the active ingredient there is, is Tebuthyron. Um, you know, years ago, they were we were putting that on by air down in, in the Chautauqua Hills area, killing oak trees, and uh, you know it can be, be quite quite effective at that. You know, it's a 20% product, so. You know, 10 pounds would be two pounds and 20 is four, four pounds and of active, or, of, yeah, active ingredient. Uh, but you can see, you know, little, some differences there. The IPT stands for individual plant treatments. Uh, but again, we can use these materials uh, for some of these trees. The pronome power pellets typically are put out, you know, one to two pallets per inch diameter of the tree. Now, if you get into, to, Something like smooth shumac there, and you know that talks about maybe number per heights, or, or a lot of times we'll 
put them out in a, in a grid pattern uh, if we want to do that. Uh, again, Smooth Shoe Max for me is one of our easier ones to control, and I would probably spray it with 2,4-D, you know, in June when just as it's starting to head out, the effective treatment. One of the advantages of these soil applied materials, of course, is then you don't have to worry about drift as you might have to with, with a foliar application. Um, but then, then they also does require moisture to get it into the soil solution. Spike is usually put out, you know, uh, could be put out this time of the year before the ground freezes, but more during the dormant period when the ground's not froze because you can get some grass damage with spike. The pronome power pellets, you put them out maybe in the late spring when we expect to get some moisture, but they also will, you know, on a slope that it'll, it'll run and you'll have a, a zone going down a hill that, that kills the grass out for a while at least. So there's some downsides of using them, even though they, they aren't gonna drift. Okay, Cerisia lespidiza, you know, problem. Uh, I'm not, I didn't look it up again. Probably we've got five, 600,000 acres, I suspect, infested in Kansas. Most all our Eastern counties in the state have Cerisia lespidiza. It is a statewide noxious weed. Uh, the options here, and I'm not gonna get into all these, but I'll just, you know, there's, there's really no known biological control. Uh, there is a, there's a Lespidiza webworm that I occasionally see that, that will envelop the leaves and, and prevent seed production on plants, but it just doesn't seem to survive or, you know, or widespread enough where it's going to be a, a good, uh, good approach. Uh, grazing, of course, can be effective, particularly with sheep and goats. Uh, they're more apt to eat it than, than cattle, at least. Mowing, I've done some mowing. Uh, you know, if you could repeatedly mow these plants off, you, you indeed take them out. But, you know, out in a pasture situation, we can't do that. You know, a late, late uh, July mowing or so when we might still be looking at time frame for putting up native hay. Uh, you know, again, I did that for a few years and the, and the stem numbers started to go down. Uh, probably prevented seed production most years, but again, uh, some of those plants were still surviving. Been, been some work done on with burning. Some of you may have been hearing about, you know, Dr. Casey Olson had students looking at what I'll call growing season burns. Now, this is a picture I took about a month after burning. Uh, actually, the fire occurred in August on Fort Riley. And, you know, I, I didn't, it looked like all the crowns were coming back to me. Uh, and that's, you know, they, they will resprout following fire. The advantage that the the growing season burns have though is it does basically eliminate seed production on those plants. Uh, fire will also stimulate seed germination on the Cerisia regardless of the time of the year but so if you have if you burn there say mid mid August or something and, and you get some uh, seed germination those use those seedlings I think we need to go out and mark some but I don't think they're going to survive uh, winter typically because it's kind of a weak seedling it takes a while to get Get established. Uh, in the case like I saw here, you know, with a month after uh, fire, you know, I, I've been real tempted to go out and, and spray those with, you know, with a remedy, for instance, and try to finish those plants off. So combining fire and the herbicide. Chemicals, and here's a list of recommendations, you know, again, for Cerisia lespidiza in, in June when they're still pretty much in a vegetative state, uh, Remedy Ultra and Pasture Guard, uh, maybe a pint, pint or so of either one of those works quite well. Uh, once we get into the fall though, or late summer when the plants are, are blooming, uh, then the products that contain met sulfuron like Escort XP, uh, half an ounce usually does a good job. Chaparral and Cimarron Plus also have met sulfuron in them and can work quite well uh, when the plants are blooming. As long as they're, they're actively blooming, if they aren't, it probably means it's dry and you don't get very good control with a herbicide when those plants are under stress like that. Uh, some different herbicides there on roadsides and then on CRP, we, we, we can go out there and spot treat uh, with Remedy, Escort, and Pasture Guard uh, for Cerisia lespides and control. And there's old world blue stem, one that's uh, getting to be more, more of an issue. You know, if you think trying to control Cerisia you know, which is a broadleaf out in grasslands a problem, and, and it is not so much because you know, we've got products so we can kill those plants, but they come back from a seed bank. 
Now we've got a warm season grass here that was introduced that we're trying to take out of our grasslands. So these two species, what we typically call old world blue stems in, or Caucasian blue stem, which has the more branched looking seed head, and then the yellow blue stem, uh, like King Ranch blue stem would be one of the varieties of that, uh, are more digitate as, as you look at that, that seed head, finger like. Uh, so this time of the year, this picture is taken further west out in Ellsworth County, but you know, if you got a patch of old world blue stem, it turns that kind of white, almost straw color. So it stands out like a sore thumb in that case. I like that hill. What's that point of hill? Yeah, that's that's you know that's like I say that's in north north uh, northeastern part of Ellsworth County, and, and it's pretty much was tall. You know, this was a, a section of land, about ninety to hundred acres on it, where this old real blue stem occurred. I'm sure was farmed at some point in time, and there's some gullies out in there, but that that got in there somehow. But the rest of that pasture, like that hill in the background, you know, got that reddish color picture taken in the fall is had good blue stem on it. Um, but you know, they had this issue with, and this was Caucasian in this case as well. Now here's, here's a stand in you know, Greenwood County. Uh, I think picture was taken probably in August. You know, this pretty, pretty dense stand here of Caucasian blue stem. And it's, it's got the, you know, a purplish looking head on it. But you know, you saw that how that that look, you know, in Caucasian, these old world blue stems, they typically get don't get more than about oh three feet tall. Uh, you know, as big blue stems got that what we call turkey flip seed head, right? And uh, so it's a different seed head, and it's much taller, taller growing. Uh, I preference would be if you're going to rely on a herbicide to treat this plant. We'll talk what we can use. Is you'd want? I think you want to do it before this stage, uh, if possible. You may indeed, these plants are still got some green in them. I think you may kill those plants, but I still worry about whether or not it may go ahead and produce viable seed. I think you want to prevent seed production if all possible. So we'd want to treat it at an earlier stage. So as I've looked at, at doing control on old world blue stem, uh, this yeah, again uh, was a rate study done in Chase County. And these are cover, cover numbers, you know, a year after treatment. Uh, the treatments there were, were done, I, I think it was uh, in uh, about mid-June. And you can see that there was indeed rates, uh, and again, it went from zero to one pound. I'll tell you right now, one pound actually is off-label. If you look at an arsenal label, this is a Mazapir, so arsenal is the trade, trade name, and three-quarters of a pound is the maximum rate that says on the label. Uh, but you see even a quarter to half pound of the uh, arsenal is a Mazapir, uh, reduce the cover fairly effect effectively. And plus, what we see is the, the warm season grasses that were growing in, a, you know, in association with the old world blue stem were surviving. Uh, the forbs, a lot of the forbs survive as, as well. So that, that's a little different because the other option is to use glyphosate, which we know uh, will reduce things, just about all, everything that's actually growing. Um, so here's a picture of this. This was, I again, I a uh, block of, of grass there that I had treated. You can see the kind of around the borders and a lot of that's old world blue stem, which you see in the picture. So this was about three months after uh, June, mid June treatment was treated and I think it was a foreground was treated once, you know, just with a quarter pound of, of the Mazapir arsenal. And then the other one was treated twice, I think about eight weeks after the first application. What you see green in this picture though, in that block, is native warm season grasses that survive. The, which is the brown looking stuff is, is the Caucasian blue stem. A uh, little bit of data here. Yeah. So this is the blue bar here is, is the old world blue stem. So in that area that treated once, you know, it was over 70% of the cover. So pretty high per, you know, cover of old world blue stem. Uh, the yellow bar is then is the warm season grass. And you can see then we got what, about two months and then about a year after treatment. And you see the forbs uh, increase tremendously. You know, if, if you didn't have uh, any warm season grasses there at all to respond, the forbs will come back in. You know, Mother Nature will fill back in with something. Some of these forbs are going to be desirable. Some of them not so desirable if they're present. You know, sometimes I see oh, lots of uh, old daisy fleabane. Uh, I've seen a wavy leaf thistle if it was there. You know, that survives this herbicide application. But then I've also seen things like uh, purple prairie clover, you know, a desirable 
uh, legume that, that survived the herbicide application. Where I treated, then this is uh, where we treated with, with twice, you have applied twice, about eight weeks apart, you know, 55% cover there on, on the old world blue stem. A year later, the way I, I had a transects going through there and, and I didn't put in putting down frames, I didn't pick up any old world blue stem. Well, there was some in that block that had been treated, but it had been greatly reduced. But see the tremendous increase in the warm season grasses, you know, they went from what 5% of the cover to over 30%. And again, the forbs were responding uh, quite well. And like I say, the, the only other herbicide at this point in time that, that we've been using for spot treatment would be uh, glyphosate. And of course, then you see uh, uh, it takes out most of the, the native grasses. So as we're using herbicides, I wanted to remind everybody, you know, that there are often grazing or, or haying restrictions uh, with a lot of these products. So here's some common products for in all these, frankly. Uh, there is no waiting period before you graze, at least with, with uh, leaf animals. If you had dairy animals, or, there might, that might be a little bit different. Uh, and then, again, if, if you're having, you're doing weed control, let's say, and, and something that you're planning to hay, whether it's native grass or brome or fescue, you know, you want to look at those labels and, and look at your timing because some of these, like Grazon, uh, P plus D, which is, you know, Picloram and 2,4-D, it is restricted use, but it's pretty effective on a lot of broadleafs, but it's got a 30-day wait period prior to hay harvest. So that, you know, you'd, ha you'd have to time that out well. And then, but there are others that aren't, aren't so long. Some of these you see ranges, and that depends on, sometimes on the rate and or the, or the, the product. Lots of different 2,4-D formulations. Some of those talk about seven days before hay, and some of them as long as 30. So there's some benefits then of brush and weed control. And, uh, you know, hopefully, you know, if we go out and spray, we're, we're replacing our unwanted species. We get, get some desirable stuff coming back. So we get increased forage production. Sometimes we might just increase availability. Um, and then you can see some other benefits. Some, if you had trees that you're removing, you might handle livestock easier. And there might be some wildlife benefits in terms of, of the way you go out doing this in terms of leaving certain areas for edge, edge of what we call edge effect, where deer, for instance, may go into the trees, but then use the open areas for, for grazing. And you can see a couple other things listed there. Okay, so kind of summarize the, the brush and weed control part of this, you know, it's, it's really a lot more economical to, to treat those woody species when they first show up, because as, as you delay, it's gonna cost you more each year. I used, to, I used to be, I was told it was about $10 an acre more for every year you waited. That number's probably gone up, you know, I don't, I'm sure it hasn't gone down. Broadcast application of broadleaf weeds isn't something I typically recommend, unless we're talking about, you know, if it affects grazing distribution, and that, it can do that, Sometimes you get a canopy of a weed that, that they don't want to eat that's obscuring the grass. They don't go in there. Or, of course, if we're working with noxious weeds and have a, a high population, we may need, need to start with a broadcast application on something like Cerecia lespedeza, for instance, to get, get it set back to where we can then maybe rely on spot treatment on it. Um, so, you know, again, I haven't talked about grazing management, but as we do that, but proper grazing management you know, using prescribed burning, spot treating with herbicides, those are techniques that we can use to, to prevent these extensive tree and brush problems. And again, you know, one of the things we wanted to emphasize too is that, you know, sometimes we just go out and we, we spray, we, we, we're, we're treating a symptom. We need to know what's causing the problem, you know, and get that solved rather than just, you know, treating the symptom. You know, is, is it because of, of lack of fire over a period of time or what was causing? Is it overgrazing? Uh, maybe it's uh, uh, haying at, at, at the wrong time of the year. All, any of those things may cause us some problems and we need to solve those rather than just thinking we might solve it with a herbicide. Okay, I want to talk a little bit about fertility. This is actually some slide that I borrowed from, from Doug Shoup on some presentations we did a few years ago for a webinar and he had some information. So here's Here's a broom sedge, which is getting to be more of a problem. I, you know, I used to think of that, yeah, it's primarily a problem in fescue, but we see it in brome. We see it, we're starting to see it on native hay meadows now as well. 
Uh, at least with the cool season grasses, it seems to be related to uh, low soil pH and low phosphorus levels. Uh, so this, this data you, you, we have here, yeah, they put, you know, you don't have any lime or phosphorus in one case. You can see the, the broom sedge is a higher percent of the composition than the fescue. Uh, when they started to put, and I says two times, I, I bet that was probably two tons of lime to the acre and, you know, 50 pounds of phosphorus. Yeah, then you start to shift that. You know, now we're, we're stimulating the fescue, setting back the broom sedge. But it's not a one-shot deal. It's going to, you know, happen in increments and, and take several years of, of doing this probably to get uh, suppress that uh, broom sedge problem. Uh, another set with, with Bermuda grass. We got some Bermuda grass down in the southern southeastern part of the state. And and similarly, this, this one was done with, with uh, pretty high rates of nitrogen, which I'll show you some data on fer fertilizing recommendations on Bermuda grass. It will take, respond to about whatever you want to put on. Uh, but the numbers on the left here is total, total forage production. Uh, the the broom sedge are, are density, number of stems, not production. So you can see that as they, they started adding, adding the good fertilization uh, over time, then the number of stems started to go down. So they're, they're, as we're increasing the forage on, on the Bermuda grass. But again, that's, that's going to take some time, time as well. So here's uh, some per Bermuda grass fertility. And it, I think this data was collected out of southeastern Kansas. Um, and again, I, I looked up the other day, and I think urea is right around that 40, 40 cents a pound. So I think that's a reasonable number. I looked on a, on a uh, or, uh, Rates for, for you know, complete baling operation for hay production was about $20 a bale. I don't know what, what is hay worth today. And I, I just stuck in $80 a ton to use something. Um, it may be higher than that. It depends on the quality of, of the hay, of course. And, uh, but you can see that you know, with incremental increases in nitrogen, you know, that kind of starts to decline in terms of how much increased tonnage we get. But Bermuda grass, you know, I, I've seen grass, it, you can just start adding how much, how much nitrogen you want to add. I've seen rates up to 500 pounds and, and the yield's still going up uh, as long as it has enough, enough water. Um, now, you know, I use $80 a ton. If, if, uh, if hay was $60 a ton, these returns per acre there on the right would be negative. Uh, so it does depend on, on the hay price, whether or not you know, we get that uh, increase as, as, as we increase the rate of fertility. So that's Bermuda grass, uh, tall fescue, likewise. And, and again, I think I saw some numbers the other day that well it ranged again, 80, maybe to $120 a ton for, for fescue and brome hay. Um, so this is a summary of number of studies done. Uh, same sort of scenario uh, again. And I think the break even on this one was somewhere in that between 60 and 70 cents was the break even. Uh, but 80 bucks, you know, there was some additional return uh, adding that, that nitrogen. Okay, this next, I got brome here, and this is a, I've got lots of numbers, but we'll talk about it a little bit. So this is a study I had a former county agent did for us in Osawatomie in, in Lewisburg. And uh, they're both fall applied treatments, which I think were put on during the month of September. And then the spring treatments were applied, I think in late February, early March. Um, so these two sites, uh, one of them, the pH was like 5.65 and the other was six. So that's why we have some lime treatments in there by them, either with a herbicide or by itself. And you can see in some cases, uh, in fact, at the, at the Lewisburg site, just putting on, on lime by itself in the fall, uh, well, no, I guess it, was, it didn't increase it above the check. I was gonna say it increased above the check, but that was, wasn't the case. But you can see that, it, that it's in the top group with, with the, you know, higher fertility levels. And I'm sure that was because the, the pH was, was low enough where we would expect a, a Lyme response. Uh, the Osawatomi site uh, had low, was low in uh, potassium. And uh, so you can see, you know, some, there's some treatments there. In fact, you now the top, top one on the list, although there's statistics show us there's a bunch of them similar, but that top treatment, 56, 45, 34, you know, NPK, and then there's 11 of sulfur. And so that was, that was something that we've seen is that in some cases, uh, old stands, 
of uh, Rome can re respond to addition of sulfur, like say that one, uh, you know, at least, at least it seemed to be, didn't, didn't negatively affect it and seemed to, to uh, improve, the, improve the yields. Uh, yeah, I guess unless there's questions, we'll just I'll go on. What about native grass? You know, but some people, you know, maybe have a, you get down around Yates Center, you know, it's supposedly one of the native hay capitals of the world, isn't it? Uh, fertilized native grass for hay production. Um, you know, out on native range, we typically do not recommend fertilizing because it often, even by waiting till those grasses are starting growth, let's say around late April, early May, it still seems like we stimulate any cool season that's in there as well as the broadleafs. And of course, we found out that one way to set that back is, is to do a burn. Uh, you know, so you fertilize that one year, the next spring year, you're going to have to burn to set some of those species back. But for native hay production, I think particularly in southeastern Kansas, you know, it, native grasses, it does, they, they respond to a lot much lower rates of nitrogen than, let's say, the brome and fescue. You know, 30, 40 pounds of nitrogen is, is plenty. Uh, you may add, add a little phosphorus. Phosphorus has, will carry over, it may not need to be added every year, but every second or third year, you might want to put a little phosphorus in. Um, but then again, you, you may see this shift in composition you might have to deal with on it, for hay, even with fertilizing for native hay production. Well, then what about eastern gamma grass? We have some of that in the state, and uh, I've done studies on it, and you know, 75 to 100 pounds of nitrogen you could go even a little higher than that. But I've, you know, I, it's going to take, if you want to maintain a three ton per acre yield of eastern gamma grass, that would be two cuttings. Uh, you're going to have to put on 100 pounds of nitrogen because I, I know what the protein content is, what, what I'm removing. And you calculate that out and it, it takes 100 pounds just to maintain that three ton per acre reduction. And then kind of older recommendation we've had too, because a lot, a lot of times, you know, you look at our, our fertilizer recommendations, they don't talk much about the native grasses, including gamma grass, but you know, using whatever, about half whatever the soil test recommendation would be for grain sorghum might be a place to start if you want to put on P and K on, on eastern gamma grass for hay production. Yeah, and then this, this just demonstrates, uh, and this was a county agent's helped collect this data in those counties a number of years ago, but shows how, you know, the crude protein content as, as grasses and plants mature, the quality goes down. And so these are starting off in that, what, 8 to 12 percent range there early June and then they're going down and during the time when we typically think about hay you know so say let's say starting the, the first of July even about mid-August the crude protein content on native grass is going to drop about one percent for every, every two weeks so it is declining you know fairly rapidly and uh, so typically we recommend that hay and kind of let's say by mid-July uh, we haven't reached peak uh, dry matter production, but the quality is still high enough that that, that seems to be the, the best way to, to do that. Okay, let's talk a little bit about grazing management. Doing the time, I guess I've been going 45 minutes already. Um, so here's, here's some basic principles we'll, we'll talk about. I'll just kind of move on through those. Uh, demonstrate or illustrate, and this is out of a textbook, that you know, yeah. cattle are grass eaters, but they do consume other plants. As I've already mentioned, horses are more grass eaters than cattle. We don't have bison on here. What we've seen at the Kansas Prairie, bison eat more grass than cattle. Uh, sheep uh, tend to prefer forbs if they're available. Goats are, and deer, of course, are, are browsers eating the woody plants. One of these you know, different types of forages that we have available to us produced. You know, the native grasses we have are primarily warm season. Some are annuals like sedan grass, and so forth, and that you might plant around early June, and you know, you'll be able to use start using those by mid July and August. Stubble, you know, stock, you know, residues and sorghum and, and corn, uh, wheat can be, be used for, for grazing at different times of the year. And then you see the cool season grasses, which the ones we have, brome and fescue, about 75% of that production occurs in that spring time frame, and then some in the fall if, if temperatures cool off and we get moisture. Grazing distribution, you know, how do how animals disperse 
We know they, they need water. They'll seek out shade. They graze into the wind, avoid steeper slopes if they can. And that has an impact on what they're, they're utilizing. So we can you know, develop water. We may use fencing with, with rotation grazing, grazing system themselves. And we know that prescribed burning, for instance, where we've looked at patch burning, you know, where we're just burning a portion of the pasture, that indeed will attract animals and change their, their grazing distribution. Of all those things, though, the stocking rate is still probably the key factor in regardless of where you're at, type of forage you're working in, as you increase the stocking rate, in other words, less acres per animal, this is with steers, the individual gains per animal are going to decline. You may be able to maintain them for a while, but eventually they're going to decline. Um, gains per acre will, will increase. That will also go down if, if you stock you know, at a very, very high, high rate. Somewhere in the middle, not necessarily where those lines cross, but that middle range is what we've considered to be a moderate stocking rate. And that seems to be what's sustainable uh, in the long run. And uh, also usually it turns out to be the most economical as well over, over the long run. Grazing systems, you know, that's what are we trying to do with the grazing system. And uh, to me, the good grazing systems, you know, you, you, you can have a grazing system, you know, what, what is your goal, what are you trying to accomplish? To me, the better ones, I'd want like them to try to not only improve the plant, but at least maintain or improve animal production. And some of them can do that, and some of them uh, sometimes sa sacrifice some on the animal side of things. I don't, I don't go into this, the various problems with grazing, you know, if you overgraze, yeah, you're removing leaf area, that's gonna have a negative impact on the vigor of the plants, can reduce root growth and, and so forth. Undergrazing and particularly no grazing uh, can, is sometimes, uh, many times, is actually worse uh, than, than you know, overgrazing. There's some, some problems that occur with that as well. Some grazing methods. So yeah, we've got season long grazing. You just turn the animals out there, uh, leave them for the grazing period. Um, they have access, you know, generally the whole pasture. You can't adjust numbers if you like, you know, kind of put and take system if you wanted to do that during the course of the season. A lot of times that's not the case. Maybe you put them in middle of April and you take them out middle of October, 1st of November, you know, that season long system. Rotational grazing, you know, you have multiple paddocks. You could start with two pastures actually, and then get more complicated. This one's got 20 paddocks where you're moving these animals around. And it doesn't always necessarily have to be that adjacent pasture. You kind of you learn to select the one that's next ready to graze and doing a system like this. Um, you know, there, there's some advantages and disadvantages of these systems. Uh, lower input costs with the season of continuous grazing. The animals will definitely spot graze. They may only utilize 25% of the pasture, but they, they maintain good animal gains because they're eating regrowth that's, that's higher quality. But because maybe of a lower stocking rate or less harvest efficiency, in terms of the area being grazed, gains per acre may be actually be less with continuous versus rotational. And then the rotational grazing, again, the cost can be higher because it's going to take maybe more water development and fences. Uh, we may be able to increase stocking rates, although I usually encourage people to start where they were with a season long and then work, work into that and see what, what they might be able to do over time. Again, you may increase gains per acre because of a higher stocking rate, as soon as you increase stocking rates, you're probably going to decrease gains per animal. Management intensive grazing. Uh, some, some of you know, heard of the name Jim Garish is one of the people that was a real proponent of this. Again, these multiple paddock systems where the animals graze for a short period of time, selecting off, you know, fairly low utilization, maybe 10, 15 percent utilization is all, just eating the best stuff and then they move. And, you know, the first time through the Paddocks, you're going to move them fairly quickly, and then you slow that down over time. Uh, the key thing is you, know, you rest that paddock long enough so those plants can recover before you're going to graze them again. Mob grazing is an extreme example of that, uh, where again, you have very, very high uh, numbers or, or pounds of animal. We're, we're talking maybe as much as 500,000 pounds of animals to the acre. I've, in the, I've heard systems where a guy up in Canada, he had his kids moving, moving animals every 15 minutes, which that's pretty extreme, isn't it? Uh, 
But again, if you're going to do, you have that high stock density, you have to have a lot of forage to start with. So oftentimes it's it's uh, more mature, and uh, you know I probably wouldn't like. I don't think using a system where you've got um, growth animals is is going to work terribly very well with mob grazing. You know, a cow herd maybe if they don't have as high requirements can can utilize that. But you're probably looking at maybe 30, 40 percent utilization, and the rest of the forage kind of gets trampled. Uh, again, has has some uh, purported advantages. You know, hopefully maybe increasing uh, organic matter in the soil, which would increase water infiltration. There's some things like that, that that could happen under the right situations. System that was tried here with cows is is this late season rest rotation where you have three pastures, they're all grazed that May 1 to July 15th period. Then that time you combine those three herds just into two, graze for the rest of the, the summer. And uh, you know, then the next year, uh, you graze them all early because we, you know, double stocking has shown us we, we can't hurt these pastures early in the season. It's the late season that gets to be more of an issue. So then we rest a different pasture in the late season. So with this system, a pasture is rested once in three years in the late season. The data that you see here, there's no statistical difference between the, at the same stocking rate between season long or continuous grazing in the late season uh, rest rotation. So it seems to be a, a good system for cows if the three pasture system that has some rest built into. Strip grazing, you know, is one thing for thinking about grazing crop residues, this would be a good way to do that, approach that or, or even cover crops. This might be a way to do it where you have these long strips, you maybe using a hot wire to confine where the animals are, then move it over time uh, during the winter time. Preferred grazing, you know, stockpiling, that's something that works quite well with, with tall fescue. Uh, you know, you, well, that means you're, you're, you're saving that material that's been produced for later use in the year. So rather than grazing fescue in, in September, October, maybe we wait till December, January to graze it. Now we do that with other other forages. It doesn't work so well. We lose a lot so much in quality. But uh, tall fescues, typically we, the crude protein content, you know, with that stockpile of forage is still over 10%. So that, that seems to work quite well. First last grazing, again, kind of these rotations where you, if you have a stalkers or something that a higher nutritional requirement, you put them in, let them go through the pasture first, and then bring in the cows or whatever, a lower uh, group that needs lower quality behind them and rotate through. Here's complementary or sequence grazing where again has double cropping on it. So we make grazing out wheat, we take the animals to native pasture with June 1, we plant our summer annual, come back and utilize that in, in the mid to late summer, go back to native range and you could open the gates in the wintertime. This works best of course if where you have that some cropland right adjacent to a pasture that would work, where it work the best, but that can be pretty, pretty uh, successful and will greatly reduce the number of acres it takes to carry an animal when you do this. So out of all these systems, you know, we talk about grazing while well, rest is critically important. And uh, for our warm season grasses, that late summer rest is, is, is a critical time for the cool season, you know, maybe, maybe more during the summertime, you know, I know States so where, or if all you had is, is brome or fescue, where you're trying to graze through the summertime, well, we get into a drought and those grasses uh, turn white, you know, they're just not providing much, much nutrition or production for the animals. So it's better to, you know, move them to something else during that period of time and then rest the cool season. So with these grazing systems, kind of what we're doing, one way to summarize that, we, we, we graze for the animal, but we're resting for the plants. Uh, so I just get about my last slide. Uh, successful grazing management, yeah, we, when are the buds or like rhizomes being produced in late summer in plants? We're trying to uh, time or take into consideration total non-structural carbohydrates. That's what TNC stands for when these plants uh, are not too vulnerable to, to grazing use. Uh, we're, we're managing the leaf area, you know, maintaining that, that uh, photosynthetic factory so we have uh, regrowth that can occur. Uh, that's related to when we're defoliating. Uh, we, we can uh, time our grazing with rotational systems where we're moving maybe apical uh, mare stems that you know, are above the ground 
when you take those off with by a grazing animal, can actually stimulate tillering from the base of those plants, and we get another flush of growth. So that can be used to our advantage with some species. And we're trying to meet those animals' nutritional needs with various grazing programs. So with that, that's done talking. So I'm take, glad to take any questions you might have. Great, thank you very much, Walt. If anyone has a question, you can unmute or type it in the chat. Hey, Walt, um, do you have any idea how long Old World Blue Stem lasts in the seed bank? Well, uh, got an educated guess. You know, that's, I guess we call that, that's a swag, right? A scientific wild, you know what, guess. Um, more than three years. We're pretty sure of that. Um, but beyond that, you know, I'm thinking probably four or five years. Because um, I've seen some places where they've, they tried to deal with it and, and come back and, and uh, you know, reseed or, and things. And it came back, you know, if you, if you don't wait long enough. So at this point, I, it's, it's more than three years. You know, it's not, not the uh, long term like when, what we're dealing with with Cerecia lespedeza, where we're talking about decades, 20 plus years probably for seed viability. But uh, it's, it's, it's going to take a little bit of time. I, I don't know whether there might be a student, I think, uh, at Fort Hayes State that might be starting to look at that. But uh, just observations or people of some trials where they tried to do it, it's, it's more than three years. OK, thank you. Does anybody else have any questions, or are there any questions at some of the sites? Stop sharing. Interesting. I don't see any in the chat. I no, I'm not seeing any either. Well, again, I had had a lot of material to cover there, and, and some will go, still go over fairly quickly. If you had any specific questions about some problem species that you're dealing with, I try, could try to address those. The big issues I'm still dealing, you know, Cerecia lespedeza and, and old world blue stems are, are two of our problems, particularly here in the eastern part of the state. Although old world blue stems are, in, I think we've got that in every county in the state now, so. Can you touch on, um fall burning for Cerecia management a little bit? Yeah, and uh, we started to look at fall burning. I actually, you know, the studies that we, we've done with, you know, Casey Olson and his students, and I was involved with doing the, the vegetation sampling in that study. It was a four-year study. And we looked at burning August 1 and September 1. Those studies were done here, down here in Geary County. And uh, what we saw almost, almost immediately, uh, but within a couple of years for sure, uh, those burning times uh, eliminated seed production on Cerecia. So that's a good thing. Uh, those plants were, were still, you know, they, they still would re-sprout. I think the stem numbers over time, you know, after we did it four years in a row, and it, it was a kind of a, uh, an ungrazed site. They might have did some light winter grazing, but it wasn't being grazed in the summertime. So we had plenty of fuel, you know, and it burned. Uh, I don't know if you've ever done any summer burns, but, you know, they they smoke like crazy. You got all that water in the plants and you get a lot of white smoke. And you look at it and say, well, it didn't burn it off, but it desiccates those plants. And, and again, so doing that for four years, you know, I think the trend was downward on, on the Cerecia, but again, uh, who's, who's going to burn, you know, four years in a row. Um, but burning every once in a while, again, it, it would reduce the seed production. Burning at any time stimulates seed germination on Cerecia. So whether that's in the spring or in that summer time frame, what you'll see is you'll get some seedlings coming up. And again, by doing that in the that mid late summer time frame, I think those seedlings are pretty weak, and you may actually see winter kill on those. We need to go out and do a, some permanent plots and mark individual plants or something to prove that. But I'm sure I think that's what's happening. The the fall burn, it's it sure is you know in fall burn. I'm gonna say that's October one or later. That's what I'm gonna call fall. It's a lot easier to burn then than it is in, in before the 1st of September. Things aren't as green. Uh, the problem is uh, those plants may, may already have 
viable seed on it. And I'm not sure the fire is gonna, gonna eliminate it if you wait that late. What we're, study we've got going now here at Manhattan is, is we're looking at a spring burn uh, first week or so of April, and then kind of a mid 15th, 20th of August, and then an October one burn. And we picked October one, like, you know, because it's easier to burn then than it is, you know. In fact, some, some years you get out there in, in August and you want to burn and things just aren't right. You know, you got to wait for different conditions. You know, we give burn prescriptions, you know, you need certain wind speed and all. When you're burning in the summer, you want it to be hot and dry in the wind blowing, okay? <laughs> you don't want that in the, in the end of the dormant period, you know, fires are apt to get away from you. But in the summertime, uh, things are usually a lot less intense. So you need those more drastic conditions. What we've seen so far is that the average over two years, and we're doing this with stalkers, so running, you know, basically uh, stalkers for, for 90 days uh, on, on following those, all those. And the, the livestock gains on average now for the early April burn and the mid-August burn are the same. They've averaged, they're the same. The October 1 burn, the gains have been less on the stalkers. So I don't know that answers your question or not, Kevin. That's, that's a little bit of data that I'm aware of and studies that are still going. Thank you. Yeah, we, we don't really have a lot of Ceresia or Old World Blue Stems here at Manhattan on those pastures, but uh, we've got another place we're looking at summer burns on, on the Old World Blue Stem too. And I, I, we'll see. <laughs> There, it, may, it might do us some good. You know, get a hot fire and get into a crown of a, the old uh, Caucasian blue stem, in fact, is more kind of a bunch. And you get a fire in that crown that time of the year, you may indeed hurt it some, but uh, yet to be determined yet whether that's going to be successful. That would be a real game changer too, if that would work out, because that'd be sure a lot cheaper than applying herbicide. I, I have a fescue question. So if you have uh, Kentucky 31 fescue pastures and some bare places and you try to replant with endophyte free fescue, will it just uh, revert back to yeah, having? Think, you know, if, if the other stuff is just the regular old Kentucky 31 that's endophyte infected, I don't, you know, it's gonna be very effective. I, th I think you're, it, it may depend on what percentage of the stand, you know, that, that's what it gets down to. You know, it usually um, we, we, leave, we lose a certain amount of average daily gain for every, you know, every 10% that's infected. I can't remember what that number is right off the top of my head, but I know you, you, if you got 50, 60% of your field infected, you're, you have a significant reduction in, in stalker gains. Yeah, in those, those cases, you know, that you, you might be at the point where you need to renovate, you know, uh, Get, get take take out the the endophyte infected and come back with a with a novel endophyte variety and there's several of those now but something like Max Q for instance it's been around quite a while but there are others. So how would you go about renovating then? Well, again, you look. We got some uh, recommendations in our chemical weed control guide and and again, usually uh, you you want to use utilize that fescue pretty hard in the fall. Uh, let it re regrow a little bit and then spray it with Roundup. You may need to come back in the spring and hit it again with another application of Roundup. We're using Roundup. You could, I think Paraquat can be used in some fashion too. It's a little more, you know, of course, toxic and to deal with, but, and with the, with the, uh, with the Roundup, of course, there's no soil activity. That's why we can hit it a couple times and then still plant into that in the, in the spring of the year. So how do you know if you have endophyte uh, problems with your fescue? Well, uh, you, you can collect some plant materials and send them here to our plant pathology department. I think we still got somebody here that, that can determine that for you. Okay. And then one last question on fescue. Uh, what, what other things should you plant in with a fescue to get some uh, species diversity? Well, there's, you know, one of the things that's been used a lot over the year, you know, uh, even Korean, Korean, you know, animal lespedesas uh, will, will grow quite well. 
particularly in you know, the southeastern part of the state. Um, they may work as, as well as anything. Um, one of the advantages that that has, if you happen to have some broadleafs in there, the, the, less, the annual espadises are, they'll tolerate a little bit of 2,4-D. You know, they, they, you know, a lot of our other legumes, you know, if using red clover. The other one would be white, white or ladino clover would be another typical one that gets used. Uh, with fescue. Um, so that, those would be the typical things, stick, stick a legume of some kind in with it. Uh, something that's going to provide some growth during the, the heat of the summer when the fescue's not exactly growing. And hopefully then provide some, some nitrogen there as, as well uh, to increase the grass production. Okay, thank you. We have a question in the chat. Do you have any recommendations for stocking rates in mob grazing systems? <laughs> no, uh, I, I don't know if there's any, any uh, rule of thumb even. I, I've seen numbers though that anywhere, you know, usually they're, they're talking about hundreds of thousands of pounds you know, of animal, so very high. Um, and again, the, the, the I think I think it's it's uh, as we go east, we're in higher rainfall areas. My 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 maybe it's a bias, but I think it's more apt to, it's apt to work better there than it does in drier regions. I know of a study up in in the Nebraska in the Sand Hills, and they did it on actually on some like almost sub irrigated meadows, so fairly production, pretty good production, and and I think they were using maybe two hundred fifty thousand pounds the acre. Uh, and moving these animals around, but um, you know they didn't didn't increase organic matter there. They didn't see some of these purported benefits that that I've seen elsewhere. Yeah, you know, I, I you know again stocking rates. Uh, uh, we talked about that on, on some of these other forages, but for that uh, it might be kind of just just trial and error because again, what what you know, a lot of places they, they've done this is is all. Uh, it depends on what size your pack. You know, some places where it takes a lot of acres normally, you know, they may they, they put a bunch of animals in there and they graze it basically to the ground once. They don't come back that year. You know, they aren't rotating. They're just going through one pasture to the next, one after another, and don't don't intend to come back. Uh, so that's one way that those those that mob grazing is done. Uh, again, I, I think something short of that might be a better system. Now, I think the management intensive systems, you can make those, those work quite well and they aren't near as intense. And again, you know, if you aren't doing anything else in your life and you can spend moving animals a couple times a day, okay, maybe you try one of those, but most people aren't gonna do that. You know, like say with management intensive, maybe if I've got, you know, if I've, if I've got, let's say if I got eight paddocks, you know, maybe, maybe I spend two days per paddock the first time through. So I'm lying on about two, two weeks of rest before I get back to the one I started on. And that time, you know, I maybe start slowing it down. Because as, as the grass growth slows down, you need to slow down your growth. The, the time you're, you're grazing, allow more rest. So by the end of summer, maybe now you're in there four days or something before you move. But that's kind of, that, that's, that's not a set in concrete either. You kind of learn... There's a lot of art in learning how to, to rotate animals. It's hard to do it just by the calendar. Give you some guidelines of where to start and see whether that works, but you kind of kind of figure it out yourself almost. And that's all kind of based on leaving in enough leaf area so those plants will regrow so that so you have something to graze the next time you come in. Okay, thank you. Are there any other questions or from the groups? at the different places. This has been recorded, so the recording will be available. And um, I will also put Walt's contact information.